Good morning, everybody, and whilst we're still standing, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, it is before your throne of grace that we come this morning to thank you, firstly, for the precious gift of your son, Jesus, whom you sacrificed to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Father, for this morning that you've given us, this opportunity that we have to gather together in your name. We pray, Father, that you bless our time this morning. What is said with human weakness, Lord, may your Holy Spirit make it power in our lives, Lord. For those who couldn't be amongst us, either through illness or uh, their holidaying, uh, the school holidays are on, Lord, as well, we pray, Father, that you bless every single one of them as well and give them a portion of their blessing, along with those who may be uh, f- uh, watching us and joining us online. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning again to everybody. Yesterday was a beautiful day and today certainly is a little bit different, but um, hopefully the weather does clear up soon. This morning I'd like us to open our Bibles uh, and we will read from the Gospel of Mark and uh, we'll read the first uh, chapter, but we'll just read the first 20 verses. So the Gospel of Mark chapter 1 and we'll read the first 20 verses and in fact we will focus I'll read the first 20 verses for context but we will focus on verses uh, 16 through to 20 for our message this morning so we begin from verse 1 the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of God As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and lose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And these four verses now, are five verses, sorry, are the focus of what we'll speak of tonight, uh, this morning, sorry. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in a boat with the hired servants and went after him. So, as morning broke, I'm sort of trying to put ourselves in the scene here, in verse 16, the first rays of sunshine revealed some hard-working men busily engaged in their occupation. These men were used to seeing the sun rise over the Sea of Galilee. They were fishermen. 
and their job required them to fish during the cool of the night when the fish were feeding. I've had the opportunity to go fishing a few times with, uh, with Paul and some others, and they get up really early, with varying degrees of success, may I add. However, these were professional fishermen. This was their livelihood, and they would be up all night fishing, um, and then um, after a long night of fishing, all that was left was to clean the catch, mend the nets for the next day, and then sell the fish to those who then sold it onto in the markets. That was their job. Being a fisherman was a hard life, but it put bread on their tables and a roof over their heads. And it, while it was a hard life, it was also an important life that they led all the people in Israel and in other places surrounding them depended on these catch, catches of fish uh, that these men brought back to shore to also feed their families. So it was an important role. So as they were finishing their work, we pick up in verse 16 for the night so they can go home and rest their weary bodies. It was all very manual, this labour. Um, a man passed by on the shore he spoke just a few words to them, but, they, but what they heard and what they responded would forever change the course of their lives. That was the scene when Jesus passed by the boats with Peter, Andrew, James and John were working. Peter and Andrew were brothers, as were Andrew, um, and, um, sorry, Peter and Andrew were brothers, as were James and John. They were brothers as well. Um, all his call, Jesus' call to these four men would forever change their lives. The public ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth was just commencing, and one of his first acts is to choose some men to assist him in his work. He was calling ordinary men to do the extraordinary work of God. And he's still calling today. He's calling people, firstly, to come to salvation. He's calling them to come also to service. And I wonder if the Lord has been calling you an ordinary person to do extraordinary work for him. And our text this morning reveals something about this matter of the Lord's call. This passage that we've read reveals several characteristics concerning the call of the Lord. And I want to examine these characteristics today in the short time that we have. And if the Lord is calling you, you need to know how to recognise Firstly, his voice, and also how to respond to it. The first thing that we notice is that his call is very personal. This is seen in the fact that he walked up to the boats and called out these four men specifically and individually. There are other boats anchored on the Sea of Galilee that morning. There would have been a whole fleet of them. But he called and approached just four specific men in these two specific boats. He called them personally. And so it is with us. The call of the Lord is an intensely personal matter. It doesn't matter what the person next to you is doing or is not doing. He calls us individually. He deals with us. And he does so one on one. When Jesus called them, he found them working hard. Peter and Andrew were casting the net, whilst John and James were mending their nets. And it seems that his call fit them perfectly in terms of their personalities. You see, for instance, Peter and Andrew were casting the net when Jesus called them, 
And Peter and Andrew later on were always casting the gospel net. They were either uh, preaching fiery sermons or they were actively bringing uh, people to Jesus. And you see that throughout the gospels. They were casting that net and later they would be busy with evangelism. On the other hand, James and John, when Jesus spoke to them, they were spending the time mending their nets. James and John spend the time mending the gospel net as well in the future to ensure that the fish, the fish didn't swim away. The main emphasis seemed to be the progression and growth of the church and the body of Christ. Why do I raise this? You know, sometimes the church means mending. The body of Christ needs edification. And that's what James and John did in their ministry. And both of these ministries are desperately needed by the church. The point is this. The point that I want to make is that the Lord designed and gifted each of us individually and for a specific uh, purpose. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you see that. He said some were given to evangelism, some were given to um, uh, preaching the gospel, prophecy, etc., etc. It talks about the body of Christ and how everybody has. With our strengths, with our weaknesses, and he will use us to do his work. Not all of us have the same gifts, but God has a place for each of us to lay before him. The question is, are you doing what the Lord has equipped you to do, where he has called you to do it? And don't miss the fact as well here that Jesus called men who were busy in their own way and life into his service. He did not go out looking for lazy men sitting at home to carry out his work. Far too many want the Lord to use them and they sit and wait for him to come by. He has already placed you in his family. He has placed you in your workplace. He has placed you in Melbourne. If you will just look around, you will see that there is plenty of work that you could be doing exactly where he's placed you. If you want, if I want the Lord to use us, to use you, we need to be busy where we are. When you are faithful where he has placed you, he will eventually open up larger areas of service for you. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. And the event describes, in fact, this event we've read, describes the second encounter that these men have had with Jesus. The first time they met him, in fact, was in John, we read about it in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42, and it's alluded to here in the first bit that we read as well, where in particular Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, and heard, they heard about Jesus and met Jesus there when he was baptised by John the Baptist. And they were called there to follow him in salvation. Here though, here specifically where we read, they are called into his service. Regardless of what this life leads you into, the most important thing in the world is having that first all-important meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to meet him first in salvation before you can do anything else for him. Getting saved, however, is the beginning of your journey. It is not the end of the road. After the Lord saves us, he wants us to move deeper with him. He desires that we become his disciples. 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, we read, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Regardless of the type of call that comes our way in life, whether it be for salvation, whether it be a call for service, the call needs to be heeded and never ignored. And when Jesus passed by that day, the real call was felt in the hearts of the four men who left everything to follow him. No doubt their hearts were touched and they felt a strange power drawing them to go to Jesus. You will notice that neither, in verse 20, neither Zebedee, the father of, um, of John and James, or the hired servants working in the boats, um, or any of the other fishermen around who may have been listening in, received the call. And so it is with any call from God. No man knows what is happening in a person's heart until they make the fact of what God is doing to them public. His call, as I said before, is personal, it is private, it is between the Lord and the person with whom he's dealing. And that is why if you're speaking to someone and reaching out for years or days or months or whatever, whether it be a family member or a mate from school or a work colleague, don't lose hope because you don't know what is happening in that person's heart because it is many times between the Lord and that individual until they confess publicly. Evidently, the Lord had been dealing with these four men since they had first met him, as we read in chapter 1 of John. That explains why they reacted instantly when he called them to follow him. And I wonder what the Lord is saying to us this morning. Is he calling you to be saved? Is he speaking to you of some kind of service? Is he calling you to leave all and follow him? If he's speaking to your heart, you can't ignore him. But come to him and trust him by faith. The Lord does his private work, as we've just touched on. But he gets no glory, no glory, until his will is worked out publicly. These men were called upon privately, individually, and then publicly to make a public stand for Jesus. They were called upon to publicly line up with him, his preaching and his program. Through the years, there have been a few servants of the Lord who have tried to keep the love for him quiet, and I'm thinking of, in the Bible, Joseph of Arimathea, John chapter 19, or Nicodemus, who came to him at night, John chapter 7, and their attempts at private service did not last long. God did not save us and call us so that we could hide ourselves away and pretend that we are just like everyone else. His call demands that we take our stand with him, regardless of what others may say about us. We have been called to a public service, not to a secret service. We live in a world with people, to put it bluntly, who are headed to hell. They are trapped in darkness, they are lost, and they need help. And one of the best ways we can reach out to them is to live openly and honestly for the glory of God. In our Bible study, we were talking about this matter. How do we deal with somebody and should we interact with someone who is not a believer? 
And in fact, um, Stav had brought up some, an excellent example of a friend of his who is not a believer and is a challenge sometimes to deal with. But the point is that the individuals that we touch in our lives who don't know the Lord, who are lost, we may be, in fact, the only contact that we'll ever have with someone who is the light and salt of this earth. And it's an important responsibility for us to be aware of. We are called to be the salt and light. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, we read, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are also the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In the world, we are called to be the salt and the light. It's a public calling. Our duty is to live a clean, holy and public life for the glory of God. And yes, that person at your workplace, that mate of yours or that girlfriend of yours at school that you hang around with, they may be the only person that they may ever come across who is a believer. And that is a responsibility that you have before God to be that light on the hill for them. Now, these men were nothing special. They were just common, ordinary fishermen. Their clothes would have been stained with salt water, their hands ragged, their beards and their hair probably matted from the salt spray, probably stunk of fish as well. They were just common, hard-working, ordinary fishermen. They were not highly educated or especially wealthy. That's why they were fishermen. They were not among the movers and shakers of that society. Nothing set them apart from the thousands of others that lived around the Sea of Galilee. Yet the Lord chose them and called them to be the first of his followers. And what a privilege they enjoyed. And that has always been God's way. He locates his finest treasures in the most obscure of places. He chose David over all of his older and larger brothers. He chose Moses, who had a ripe old age of 80, was a murderer, a stutterer, and a fugitive from justice. He chose Abraham from all the thousands of other men who lived in the era of Chaldees. He chose Paul, who hated the church and persecuted Jesus Christ. Jesus chooses those whom no one else would choose. Jesus chooses me when I wouldn't even choose myself. And he does that so that he can get the greatest glory. The very fact that a person gets saved, a sinful person who does not deserve it gets saved and then is allowed to serve the Lord is a privilege and a blessing beyond comparison and even beyond comprehension. After all, we all deserve to be in hell. And the only reason we have hope is because of God's grace. And to think, to think that he would save sinners like me and you and then use us to carry his work is a truth that is precious beyond belief. The fact that he would use a broken man like me, a broken man and woman like you, for his work, 
for work that is so valuable defies logic and belief, and yet he takes us like we are, saves us by his grace, and puts us into service. That is what the Lord does. And what the world sees as trash, he sees as treasure. Never take your salvation for granted. What he did when he called you and saved you is a thing far more precious than the mind can comprehend. And if the Lord is calling you to come to Jesus for salvation, don't spurn his call. If he is calling you to a deeper level of service after salvation, as he did here with his four fishermen, do not hesitate because his call is precious. And these men were called upon to make some really expensive choices. They were called to leave their friends. They were called to leave their family, their business. Basically the only life they had ever known. They were expected to trade the certain for the uncertain. The visible for the invisible. The known, what they did every day, for the unknown of what was ahead. Their ability... They knew how to fish for their inability because they didn't know what was ahead and the possible for the impossible. These men knew fishing inside out, but they were helpless when it came to doing that which Jesus was calling them to do. His call was a call that would cost them everything. In the end... All of them, but one, would die a martyr's death for this man who was calling them to follow him this morning. This call was a costly call for every single one of them. Yet they determined that the price was worth paying. And the Bible says they immediately, in verse 18, they immediately left their nets. Just left it. And they walked off and left everything behind. Jesus was worth more to them than anything that may have been in front of them and were walking away from. In Mark chapter 8 verses 36 and 37 we read, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for? For his own soul. And they knew this. They knew this at that moment. When the call of Jesus comes into your life and mine, we need to understand that often it will cost us a lot. Of course, his salvation is given freely by grace. But the cost of being saved and of selflessly, selflessly serving the Lord is often a very high price to pay. There will be those in your life who will not understand it when you get saved. They will not understand the change in your life. They will not understand your reordering of priorities. They will not understand the desire to follow him. They will not understand the differences that Jesus makes in your life. And they will not understand how you can give up everything to walk with him. It just won't make sense to them. And as a result, many will turn their backs on you and have nothing further to do with you. If anyone ever tells you that serving the Lord is an easy road, they are lying to you. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. I'll read from verse 37 to 39. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
and he who finds his life will lose it. And he who will lose his life for my sake will find it. When the call of Jesus comes into your life and mine, we need to understand that often it will cost us plenty. If anyone ever tells you, as I said, that serving the Lord is an easy road, they are lying to you. There will be trials. There will be self-sacrifice. There will be problems. There will be enemies. But even with all the difficulties, they rear their ugly heads as we pass through this world. Jesus is worth it all. And when the Lord's call came, these men left their nets, their profession, without question. They didn't call a committee meeting. They didn't have a debate. They didn't generate a business plan. They didn't take a vote, ask about a contract, inquire as to the length of service. When Jesus called, these men left everything to follow him immediately. They left their nets, their ships, their incomes, their friends, their families, and they took on a new lifestyle of just doing what Jesus was doing. Walking. When they started on after Jesus, they just started walking in his direction. That was it. To his destination. At his pace. And at his speed. And following in his steps. And that is what serving Jesus is about. When they walked away, they were never able to make a return to the old life. In fact, in fact, they tried, but they could not go all the way back. If you read in John chapter 21, after the death of Jesus Christ, what did they do? They decided to go back fishing. It didn't last long. Jesus changed everything for these men their lives would never be the same. And as I said before, in fact, they were martyred for Jesus, all of them, except for John, who was exiled to Patmos. All these men knew was the life of a fisherman, and when Jesus called them to follow, he made them a promise that was framed in, a word, in words that they understood. He told them that they would still be fishing, but from now on they would be fishing for men. Instead of casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee, they would be casting the gospel net into the Sea of Humanity. Instead of a literal net, they would be using the Word of God. He promised to take them as they were and make them into what he wanted them to become. He didn't say to them, by the way, as you're coming along, uh, bring your nets or um, bring some fishing line and tackle, or, uh, or um, uh, bring the nets and some of those cleaning implements you've got. No, just come as you are. There is nothing that you can bring apart from your willingness to serve. And that is just what he did. He changed each one of these men and used them in powerful, profound ways for the glory of God. Jesus caused them to become what they had never been and what they had never intended to be. And when, he, when his call comes to you, you can expect some changes to take place. You might think the Lord can't use you as you are. And you know what? He's probably, you are probably right. But he is able to work in your heart and in our hearts and make us into what he wants us to. To become. The best thing that you can do is to place the clay of your life into that hand of the heavenly potter. Place yourself at his disposal. Let him mould you into what he wants you to be and watch out because he will use you and after all the greatest ability that we have is simply our availability to be used by God. God will use you if you make yourself available to him. 
Some of God's most choice servants were the most unlikely candidates. Consider, as I said before, Saul of Tarsus. You can read about his story in Acts chapter 7 and to chapter 9. He was saved in the midst of going off to kill a whole bunch of Christians and he immediately made himself available to the Lord and God used him in the most mighty ways possible. Think about Peter here, the fisherman. Think of Gideon. Think of David. Think of Moses. Think if the Lord can use people like these for his glory, then he can use people like us. All of these individuals, David with his infidelities, Peter with his anger, Gideon with his self-doubts, Elijah with his depression and mental health issues. If he can use people like them to be these powerful men of faith, doing amazing things that jump out to us from Scripture, but if you tear it all away, are we just simple men like you and I? If he can use people like this for his glory, then he can use people like us as well. And as we conclude, when Jesus came walking by those ships that day, these four men were not wasting their time. They were actually doing what they were supposed to do. They were working. They were casting nets. That was important work. Because if you do not cast a net, you will not catch fish. You won't live for these guys, that is. The two others were mending their nets. They knew that if they had holes in the nets, any fish that they would try and catch tomorrow would probably escape from these holes in the nets and they would be wasting their time. They were busy. They were not doing anything, though, of eternal significance or value. In other words, these four men, they would have lived their lives, caught their fish, raised their families, died, and be forgotten in the pages of history if Jesus had not called them to a new life. Yet, when they followed Jesus, their lives instantly possessed eternal value and significance. God used them in ways that still impacts the world today. Little would I have known these four men at that seashore. Think of them down at Walkerville, for example. That's the same sort of thing. You know, mending their nets or hauling out their catch. That that moment would have changed their lives so much that 2,000 years or more later, there's a bunch of people in a church in a place called Melbourne still speaking about them. God used them in ways that still impacts the world today. And that's what he does to every life he touches. He takes us away from the mundane and the shallow of this world and places us in a position where we can be a part of something that is eternal, glorious, and will last forever. As I close, I want to finish with a few questions that you can each answer in your own minds. In which world are you laying up your treasures? Are you still at that seashore, just fishing for the daily catch? Or are you working for that eternal kingdom? The second is, would you like to live a life of eternal significance? And thirdly, and maybe the most important one, is Jesus calling you to come to him this morning? For salvation or maybe for service? What will you do to respond to his call? May God bless these words in our hearts this morning. Let us pray. Father, we come before your throne this morning to thank you for those moments that we've shared together. To thank you, Father, for the words of truth that we read in Scripture, Lord, for the example that you've given us of simple men who you called to become extraordinary, Lord, as they worked for you, Father. And we pray this morning that if you call 
is to, indi in, to an individual here for salvation. Lord, that you continue to shake them, Lord, to move them to understand, Father, that they need to trust in you and surrender their lives to you, Father. And for those of us who have come to know you as our personal Saviour, Lord, are you calling us for service, to rise up, to be counted for in this lost world, to be the salt of this earth, the light, the city on a hill, Lord. We pray, Father, that you help each and every one of us to think about where you've placed us and to know that we need to make an impact to those around us. We pray and ask these things, Father, in the name of